Good evening. Good evening. Hope everybody's had a good day today. I uh, want to remind everybody again that we have the Hanging of the Green coming up Sunday. And also we're going to be, uh, we uh, I guess we can officially call it that, we're going to be celebrating Thanksgiving and want everybody to bring enough for your family and maybe one more. That way everybody in the building's got plenty of food to eat. And um, I, I would ask that uh, also you pray for my friend Eugene. Yesterday he uh, he lost his uh, his daddy, and uh, Brother Rubel passed away and went on to be with the Lord. He had an aneurysm, and it caused some real complications, and he didn't survive that. So I know that Rubel was ready, and uh, I know that he had made peace with uh, his Lord a long time ago. He had put his hope and his confidence in Jesus Christ as his Savior. And uh, talking about that, uh, let's lift that family up, but also let's remember that the same thing that Brother Rubel did a long time ago by trusting in Jesus, that's the very thing that we need to be doing today. Tonight's lesson is on the divine mediator. And uh, a mediator is a person um, who attempts to make uh, people that are, that are in a conflict come together uh, in an agreement uh, so to speak, you could call them a go-between. You say, well, I, I don't really feel like a, like I have a conflict with God, but we do have a conflict with God because God is holy and we, in the flesh, being human, we have a sinful nature. So Jesus is our mediator, our go-between. I'm so glad that he is, that he pleads our case because uh, in the flesh, we just wouldn't make it. Amen. But let's, uh, let's look at this. It says, Jesus Christ is the only mediator between God and man. And I've, I've got a scripture here that I wanted us to look at. It's 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 through 5. And it says, uh, in the book of Timothy, it says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. So God made a way by sending his son, and we've talked about this over the last few weeks, Emmanuel, God wrapped in, or literally robed, wrapped in flesh that was sent to the earth for us because it's not his will that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. So he gave us a high priest and a mediator. And, and thank God that he did. Amen. Let's look at the lesson overview. It says, this lesson is about Jesus Christ being the mediator between God and humans. Uh, as, uh, as a mediator he is by definition, it's a person who acts as a go-between for conflicting parties. And again, the scripture says, the Lord says, be ye holy as I am holy, said the Lord, for without holiness, no man shall see God. But in the flesh, we know that we are all sinful. So you have a holy God and mankind that is sinful. So there's a conflict there that had to be resolved. And the only way that could be resolved was through uh, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And it says, Christ is the mediator uh, who brings sinners into agreement with a God who is holy. So uh, when we go into mediation here as humans, if we have disputes, we go into mediation, there's give and take. Each side has to give and take and come to an agreement. Usually that's done by go-betweens. We call them lawyers down here. Well, you know, Jesus basically is your lawyer. He pleads your case. So uh, when we go into mediation, we still have to give up some things. There's still give and take. We give up sin and God takes us in. Amen. <laughs> so that's the mediation and it's done through Jesus Christ and what he accomplished on the cross. The lesson outline says that uh, he is the anchor of our soul. And the first part said that God's promise 
uh, or God's promises to Abraham. And we know what promise he made, that he would make his descendants like the sand of the sea and the stars of the heaven. He said they're innumerable and you can't count them. And you know, ever since people have been being saved because of that covenant that was made to Abraham that God extended to him. And God's not a man that he should lie. That covenant is still. Today, we've been grafted in. You're a Jew today if you're saved because you've been grafted into that line, that line of Abraham, that promise. It said there's a promise that is made certain. And we know that God sealed the deal with his son, Jesus. It was sealed and written. The contract was signed in blood. You are under a blood covenant. It's the second part says the holy intercessor, Christ's unending priesthood, and Christ the better high priest. Why is he uh, a priest that has an unending priesthood, and why is he a better priest? Because unlike other earthly priests back in the Old Testament, they had high priests that would go in once a year. They died, and Jesus is eternal. He never dies. They had to make sacrifices every year, but Jesus made sacrifice once and for all. He said, it's finished, and it was done. It was a perfect sacrifice. So it is a better priesthood, amen? And he is unending. There's no beginning, no end to him. And uh, let's, let's look here at the third part. It says, a mediator of a better covenant. And a better covenant has better promises, amen? Uh, earthly priests offered animal blood and by the law that was acceptable but jesus offered a perfect blood and that was his own blood so that's a better promise a better covenant and it says it's a covenant of the heart the old covenant is obsolete that's the reason when jesus was crucified that the veil in the temple that separated the holy of holies from the outer court where the priest would go in and make the sacrifice yearly. First, he'd make sacrifices for his sin. Then he would go behind the veil and make sacrifices for all the children of Israel. But now that does not have to take place. We are under a covenant of the heart. And old things pass away. All things become new. Now you are under a blood covenant with Jesus Christ. And we know that our heart has changed. And now we are a new creation. In Christ Jesus, you are born again. And Nicodemus, we know what he said. How can I enter my mother's womb? He was thinking in the flesh, born again. But it's not a fleshly birth. It's a spiritual birth, a new birth, a new spirit. You change when you come under this covenant. The golden text is in Hebrews 8 and 6. It says, now he hath obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator or the go-between of a better covenant, a blood covenant, which was established upon better promises. Why are the promises better? Because under the old covenant, it was a sign that they didn't want to sin, but under the new covenant, it's a promise, and it's a promise of God that he'll cover us. And God is not a man that he should lie. Men lie, but God doesn't lie, so it's a better covenant. Let's look at the teaching goals. To impart and reinforce knowledge. To help us understand and appreciate the perfect priesthood of Jesus Christ, who was chosen by the Father as our eternal intercessor. He always, continually, even at this moment, makes intercession for you and I. And the second part is to influence attitudes so that we live courageous lives of faith and confidence because Jesus is at the right hand of the Father as our mediator. Isn't it wonderful to know? I mean, I, I can live in peace knowing that Jesus always sits at the right hand of the Father pleading my case even when I mess up. He's on your side. Amen. The third part is to influence behavior to challenge us to positively influence society as godly examples of living by a better covenant through faith in Jesus Christ. And we always want the world to see Christ in us. You know, sometimes it's hard for them to see Christ in us. We get caught up in situations, circumstances. Life is hard. 
even sometimes on the best of days, life is hard. But if we have Christ living in us, we're able to overcome. We can be victorious. Historical literary background, it says, The Jews lived without the ministry of priests for animal sacrifices for 50 years, from 586 to 536 B.C., between the destruction of the first temple and the restoring of the altar for the second temple. And now, since A.D. 70, when the temple was destroyed, Jews have lived without the ministry of priests for animal sacrifices. However, because the temple was still standing when the letter to the Hebrews was written, and this was in A.D. 63-64, the ministry of priests and sacrifices were issues for Jewish believers in Jesus as the Messiah, in that Christ superseded the priest of Israel, and by his one sacrifice, once and for all, amen, of himself for all time made unnecessary the animal sacrifices that were required by Moses. Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. He meant once and for all. It's a perfect sacrifice. And that veil was torn from top to bottom. And you know, Jesus said, don't think I come to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill it. And he did. The sacrifices that used to be made uh, back there with the priest once a year, now Jesus He's made that sacrifice and that blood stands the test of time every day, 365 days a year for eternity. The blood of Jesus is sufficient. Amen. Where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. We don't live under the law of Moses anymore. We live under the grace dispensation. And I'm so glad for grace instead of law. (laughs) Amen. Let's go just a little further and read here. Hebrews 6 and 13 said, For when God made a promise, and again, we know God is not a man, that he should lie, he keeps his promises. Men will disappoint you. They will make promises or uh, maybe, uh, you know, used to. Men could shake hands and have a a transaction. They'd buy a car, a piece of land, whatever. They didn't sign contracts. They just shook hands because they all kept their word back in those days. They were gentlemen. Today, we have to sign contracts because people are trying to do wrong if you don't have them bound to a contract. Amen. But God, he made a promise and you can believe his promise. He's going to keep true to it said God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no one greater than himself. So when God said, you can trust me, I trust God. I trust his promises. Verse 14 saying, surely blessings, I will bless you and multiplying, I will multiply you. And we know when God promises blessings, his promises are yes and amen. So Abraham knew he could depend on God. Verse 15, it said, And so after he patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Because, like I said, God's word comes true. If we're willing, the scripture says, They that wait upon the Lord. We don't like waiting. And Abraham had to wait to see some of those promises come true. But they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. We know how other people have added a few words to the back of that. Teach us, O Lord, teach us to wait. (laughs) That's not scripture, but that's man saying that. And uh, we all need more of that patience to wait on God. It says, thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, uh, his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, number one. And number two, we can have strong consolation who have fled for a refuge to lay hold of the hope that is set before us. And and, you know, I made a little footnote here. I said, I wish that everyone would accept this hope and this gift that God has provided. Salvation is a free gift and salvation gives you hope every day. You know, without hope, man is lost. Without hope, we live in an eternal state of depression. And Paul said, if I didn't have this hope, I would be of all men most miserable. Can you imagine going around day to day just completely 
miserable. Without the promises of God, we would be. Let's go further here. It says, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Isn't it wonderful to know that we can trust in Jesus? And when that day does come, you know, I was thinking earlier this evening when, uh, or, well, yesterday when Eugene called me, I was thinking about when he told me his daddy passed, how long his daddy has uh, looked forward to seeing heaven and seeing uh, the promises of God. And he's already lost two wives and a lot of other family members. And he was looking forward. He said, I want to see my Jesus. He had that hope. He trusted in what God said. It said, so this hope is an anchor to our soul, both sure and steadfast, uh, which enters the presence behind the veil. So what is your hope? That's the question. What is your hope anchored in? I hope it's anchored in Jesus Christ. Where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become our high priest forever, because he was willing. He said, no man takes my life from me. I willingly lay down my life. And if I lay it down, I can take it up again. He willingly sacrificed himself. You remember in the story where Abraham was going to take Isaac up the hill and sacrifice him. The first thing out of Isaac's mouth was, Daddy, I see the wood, and I, I know you got the fire. He said, where is the sacrifice? <laughs> you know why? We don't want to sacrifice ourselves. Human nature. We don't want to sacrifice that flesh and have that flesh crucified or destroyed. But Jesus was willing to do that. In Hebrews seven twenty three, it says, Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. So, Early priests did what Jesus does not do. They die. Jesus is alive forevermore, seated at the right hand of God. It said, because he continues forever, he is an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save to the uttermost. I love that. That's one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, that God is able to save to the uttermost. There's no lengths. No depths that he can't go to and he's not willing to go to to save you if you will turn to him. Amen. It says he's able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. You see that scripture again, there's only one way. There's only one name under heaven and earth where men might be saved. And that's Jesus Christ. So it says they come to God through him since he always makes intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners and has become higher than the heavens. He who knew no sin became sin for me and you. He took our sins. On. If he didn't have sins, how did he, how did he take it? He took ours. That's how he became sin. He took our sin. He died in our place. Isn't that wonderful? We've got a Savior who loves us enough. He paid the debt that he didn't know. He died in our place. It says, we have this high priest who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's uh, sins. For this he did once and for all when he offered up himself. Hebrews 8 and 1. Now this is the main point of things that we are saying. We have such a high priest, Jesus who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not a man. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law. And that's what they did. They offered sacrifice of animals according to the law. But animal blood was not enough. There had to be a perfect sacrifice, and Jesus was willing to become that. It said, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also our mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. He, he said, I promise I'm going to purchase them, and here's, the, here's your title deed. He, he signed it in blood for me and you. You know, 
Greater love has no man than this. The scripture says that he would lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus said, I don't call you servants anymore. I call you friends. So he paid the debt for all of us, his friends, if we'll accept him. Amen. Let's go a little further. I want to read this introduction to the lesson. It says, uh, what does it mean to know that Christ is praying for you? You know, we, we pray for one another at church. We call each other and say, please lift me up in prayer. I got some things going on. I, I, I did that this week. I had several. I said, I want y'all to pray for me. I've got some things that uh, I need God to, to help me with. And, you know, we're all human. And we need to surrender our ways for his. So we, we ask one another and we bind together in unity. and We believe. Amen. But even though I've got church people that pray for me and I pray for them, we need to lift one another up. Isn't it wonderful to know we've got a mediator, a savior that continuously prays to God the Father for us. It said, we all have difficult and discouraging times in life. We need to remember in such times that Christ is praying for us, making intercession uh, to God for us. When fellow Christians are praying for us, Christ is hearing their prayers and making intercession for them. So their prayers on our behalf will be effective. Jesus Christ does this for us because he is the mediator and the high priest between us and God. There we go again. He's the high priest between. There's one God and one man between God and man. He's the between man. He's the go-between. He's the mediator. Discussing the lesson, God promises to Abraham, continuing with his exhortation that believers in Christ should follow or be followers of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises of God. And that's found in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12. The writer of Hebrews emphasizes that God is faithful to keep his promises and using God's promises to Abraham as an example of God's faithfulness the writer of Hebrews noted that God swore by himself. He is our guarantee. Amen? God is. And you, you know, sometimes if you sign a note on something that you want to loan, and the bank will say, well, we'll loan you this money, but we need something. We need collateral. Well, you know, Jesus, he's our collateral. Amen? It's, it's something that's put up that has greater value than the debt that's owed. Oh, I love that. We have greater collateral than the debt that is owed. Jesus' righteousness is greater than our sin, our debt, our sin debt. Amen. Let's go further here. It says, question for application. Why is the promise God made to Abraham to make of him a nation and a blessing to all people important for every person who believes in Jesus as the Messiah and the Son of God? Because now we are grafted in. We're all children of Abraham and we all are heirs to those promises that God made to Abraham. That's why it's important to us. Amen. Uh, let's go to the promise made certain here. It says, the writer of Hebrews says, God confirmed or guaranteed his promise to Abraham by an oath. That is, by the declaration of intent based solely on his own unchanging faithfulness. Scripture says, when we are faithless, God is what? Faithful. He's unchanging, unwavering. Thus, by two immutable or unchangeable things, by his promise and his oath, God made certain his word uh, of his word to Abraham. In this respect, the promises of God were and are assured because it is impossible for God to lie. We know men are lie, but God does not lie. This truth provides the recipients of God's promises something on which they can anchor their hope, namely that Jesus Christ is himself God's promise of salvation and he has entered into the heavenly holy of holies within the veil to minister as our high priest for all who will believe in him. Amen. 
How does knowing that God cannot lie strengthen your faith in the word of God and give you confidence to believe the promises of God in the Holy Scripture? And what does it mean to you to have your life anchored in the hope that is set before you, who is Jesus Christ? What does being anchored imply about the stability of your faith? Uh, Because I, I know now I trust in Jesus. So I know I can trust in the salvation that he has provided through that atonement that he made on the cross. Amen. And, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul said it better than anybody. He said, I'm assured, I, I believe fully that he will keep that which I have given him until that appointed day. Paul wasn't worried about dying because he knew that God's promises were still going to come true no matter what. He said, well, to live is Christ and to die is gain. He had full confidence if he took his last breath, he was going to be with the Lord. Amen. And I have that confidence. I hope you have that confidence today. Response to the word. Knowing that God cannot lie and that he has given to us an exceedingly great and precious promise regarding our salvation and eternal life, we have every reason to hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Our faith as Christians is not based on a fabricated tissue of lies, but on truthfulness of the gospel and of the whole word of God or the Bible. The apostle Peter wrote to his fellow Christians, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. He was telling them, this is not a made up story. We saw Jesus. We walked with him. We watched him do miracles and raise the dead. You can believe and you can have assurance in this salvation. He said, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. It is intelligent and wise and in our own best interest to be anchored in the promises of Jesus Christ. Questions for application. As a believer in Christ, how would you explain to someone the reason why Jesus Christ has superseded and replaced the priesthood that God had ordained for Israel through Moses? And as a believer in Christ, What effect does it have on your praying? I can tell you the effect it has on mine, peace. When I pray, I have peace. To know that Jesus lives forever and is making intercession to God for us. And now he can fulfill the office that the the earthly and fleshly high priest could never fill eternally. Jesus can fill that office eternally once and for all. Let's look at mediator of a better covenant. It says better covenant and better promises. Here the writer of Hebrews sums everything up. The doctrine of Christ is high priest. The main point of this doctrine is the superiority of Jesus. And God said that he's given him a name that is above all names. And at the name of Jesus, every knee, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And now he's seated on the right hand of the throne of majesty or God in the heavens. The priestly ministry of Jesus is not done in a tabernacle or a temple built by men, but in the sanctuary and true tabernacle made by God. It's in the heavens. The tabernacle and the temple in which the priest of Israel served, offering sacrifices to God, were the example and shadow of heavenly things that were to come. We hear about types and shadows. Well, when that priest would go behind the veil and he would be there before the mercy seat, he would go before the Ark of the Covenant and he would make sacrifice. It would atone for the sins, amen, but it had to be redone every year. But now we have a high priest who is behind the veil eternally. He is before God eternally. His blood is a sacrifice eternally. It never has to be shed again. Well, they'll never crucify Jesus again. He finished. He said, it is finished. It's a perfect job. Amen. What God's people, Israel, the Jews, had under the law of Moses was good. So how would you explain why everything provided for us through Christ is better? Because we don't have to. Aren't you glad? Think about it. Aren't you glad that now you don't have to go gather up birds or sheep or calves and 
uh, spend all that money on all those animals and drag them to the temple and take them to the priest and confess all your sins before a man. And you got people still doing that today. They go in a little box and tell this man all his sin. He can't forgive your sins. I know people, that's a big going thing. You know why they like that? Because they can send their brains out, go in a little box and say a few Hail Marys. And guess what? It's all over with. It's not like that now. Now we can go boldly before the throne of grace. We say, Father, in the name of Jesus. That's our mediator. We have an audience with God immediately. Amen. Amen. Let's go back here. Why did the old covenant fail to hold people in a right relationship with God? Did God fail to keep his part of the covenant or did people fail? I can tell you right up front, people fail because God never fails. He is incapable of failure. So men, even after those animal sacrifices were made, they went back and sinned again. And the next year, those sins had to be atoned for again. <laughs> over and over can you imagine what a, a grueling, I, I'd hate to have to keep that up year after year. It says, when by the new covenant we are born again by the Spirit of God and the Holy Spirit of God writes his laws on our mind and on our heart, how does this enable us to love and obey God? Because as, as man, we will, if we have our own will and our own way, we'll sin. Amen. But when we let God write his laws in our heart, we don't want to disappoint God. So we'll follow those commandments. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. I want to read another response to the word called the discipleship ministry in action. Then we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. This letter to the Hebrews was written to encourage Jewish believers in Jesus not to defect from the faith in him. And can I tell you, I'll stop for a second here. If people knew how close we were to the return of the Lord, this is no time to fail. Failure is not an option. This is no time to turn back. You know, the Happy Goodmans, they sang that song. Oh, I wouldn't take nothing from a journey now. Gotta make it to heaven somehow. Though the devil tempt me and he tries to turn me around. He's offered everything that's got a name. All the wealth I'd want and worldly fame. If I could still, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. We are closer to heaven than we've ever been. No time for failure. Amen. It says this should be a constant reminder to us that the four gospels and the rest of the New Testament were all written that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, and the Son of God, and that believing in him, we might have life through his name. This is found in John chapter 20, verse 31. In the face of increasing hostility toward believers in Jesus Christ, and boy, the world hates you if you believe in Jesus today, amen. Nothing is more important than that we keep our faith in him as the Messiah and the Son of God and the only Savior that can save sinners. And we need to not only believe it for ourselves, we need to teach it to our families, tell it to our friends. We need to be shouting out loud, telling people Jesus is the only way. The call to discipleship. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not, the, uh, is not only good news, but it is the best news ever brought into this world. We knew it was announced by the angels. We'll talk about that in a few weeks when it comes to Christmas season. We'll be talking about the angel making the proclamation for unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior, which is Christ the Lord. Can you imagine that proclamation being made? Therefore, as disciples of Jesus, let us always be ready and willing to make this good news known to the many people who need to hear it and boy, the world, if they ever needed to hear about Jesus, they need to hear about him today. Amen. Let's look at ministry in action. We'll go to Lord in prayer. In the face of growing opposition from a secular world against believing in Jesus Christ, we who believe in him must continually pray and encourage one another to be faithful to him. Amen.
And I got this scripture, I jot it down now. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. We've not seen Jesus with our natural eyes. Oh, but by faith, I know that heaven is real and I know that I have a savior, a high priest, a go-between, a mediator that constantly makes intercession for me and for you. And that's the hope that we have today. Amen. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for our mediator, our go-between, our high priest and our friend. He calls us friends, Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, that he was willing. He said, nobody takes my life. I willingly lay my life down. We thank you that he was willing, God. Help us to always be mindful of that sacrifice, to give honor to that sacrifice that was made by him and to share that good news of Jesus Christ and his salvation with the rest of the world around us. Bless our church. Bless this upcoming Thanksgiving season we're about to go into, Lord, and bless this Christmas season that's coming up. Lord, I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would send, oh God, you would send the Spirit that would convict people and turn them again and make them have thankful hearts on this Thanksgiving, God. And Lord, that they would have repentant spirits, God, that they'd recognize that you loved us so much that you sent a Savior to be born and in the humblest of places, God, so that we, God, could be forgiven of our sins. I pray that, Lord, touch our church people, touch those that are sick in body, and I pray that you touch my friend Eugene, his family, and this loss that they've suffered. And I pray it and believe it. I pray for that peace that you give that passes all understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed, church.